Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and start. Hi, you in the back. My name is Jenny, and I'm proud to be presenting on behalf of the Brooklyn Museum tonight. Um, for and well, I'd like to start by welcoming all of you to Thursdays at seven at the Brooklyn Museum. Each week on Thursday evening, we offer programs that range from film screenings to conversations to music. And once a month, we offer a program titled In Conversation that addresses a specific um, hot, to hot topic issue. Um, this evening's, or this month's In Conversation brings together project and thought leaders in a discussion that seeks to empower um, community members, organizers, and artists to confront issues surrounding uh, globalization and gentrification. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Todd Lester, Executive Director of the Global Arts Corps, founder of Free Dimensional, and creator of Lanchonette.org to begin our, our conversation tonight. And thank you all for coming out. So uh, my name is Todd Lester, and I'll just briefly give the names and a little bit about some of our panelists this evening. So on the far end is Paula Siegel. Uh, she's the founder of 596, one of the founders and, and lead coordinators of 596 Acres. Um, she's also done a lot with street law teams, and I, the list could go on and on. Um, Sarah Schulman, right beside her, is the author of 16 books, one of which is Gentrification of the Mind, Witness to a Lost um, Imagination. Oh, goodness, I always, whew. Sometimes I forget <laughs> whenever I'm in front of people. Uh, welcome, Sarah. Mitty Owens, to her uh, left, is uh, a community organizer. He's been living and working in Brooklyn for many years and uh, has been working with FURY, Families United for Racial uh, Equality and... Economic Equality. Economic Equality. And um, beside him is Risa Wilson, the founder of the Laundromat Project. So I'd like to first thank all of the panelists for agreeing to join this discussion and just tell you a little bit about why I wanted to bring this group of thinkers and doers together. I, of late, I've been occupied with, or preoccupied with the question of how do we live with money? And this, <laughs> how do we live without it? Good question. <laughs> how do, it's almost like the, uh, the, Yes. We'll get there. <laughs> I was going to say it's almost, it's almost like a relationship that is not good for you, but you're not sure whether you want to live with it or without it. I feel like money is kind of that way. Um, I have for the last 10 years been an arts administrator and specifically an artist residency administrator. And therefore, I've become, say, acutely aware of a double-edged um, discussion around what art can do for communities. Um, I think behind the claims of what art can do for communities, there, there is what it can do and what it does end up doing. And I would say that the difference between those two realities is five, 10, 15 years of engaging and holding steady and continuing to build consensus in an evolving way and not um, not acting like once consensus is built that you can move on and that it stays that way, it stays stuck to the, to the bulletin board, but that it is a living thing. Um, I'm also these days particularly interested in a growing, a growing rubric, uh, creative placemaking that I've been hearing a lot of lately um, in the same discussions as economic development. So what I would like to do before I invite the panelists to tell you a little bit of what's on their mind, what they're doing in their daily practice, uh, what worries them. I, these are some of the questions I asked them to consider as they took this theme of globalization and gentrification um, to bear. Uh, but before I do that, you all know what we're going to talk about tonight, and perhaps you know some of the speakers. And I'd like to see very quickly if there's any pressing um, ideas or questions that the audience might have. I'd like to ask for one, two, or three, just 10 second interventions where you could, we can test the temperature a little bit, and you can put some questions at the front of the table rather than in the Q&A that will follow the discussion. I've already heard one, one lady in the second <laughs> row say, how do we live without money? Are there any other um, observations on the, the topic or pressing ideas? Got one over here. Uh, mine would be, why here and why now? 
Anybody else, very quickly? No pressure. We'll, there's one in the back row here, and then we'll... <coughs> How do we live without money? Why here? Why now? And one well, more. Th this is also uh, similar to the money issue. I guess uh, the, the biggest hot thing to, for foundations to fund now is large-scale community development that involves artists in some way. So I guess I'm just kind of wondering what the coolest examples you guys know about that. All right. Or uh, just sort of any thoughts on how to move forward in that direction. Okay. Did you say artists in, in subways? No. Large-scale community development. How to involve artists in that, in some ways. In some ways, not subways, because there is also an initiative for artists in subways, so I wanted to make sure. <laughs> okay, thank you for those questions. And um, what, I will, what I will do, and I won't take much time doing it, is I will try to answer the why here, why now for me and for the convening, and then I'm going to hand it straight away to Risa Wilson to talk a little bit about her work. Uh, why here, why now for me is that you know, I've been in, in the Bed-Stuy, Clinton Hill, uh, Crown Heights neighborhoods of Brooklyn for over a decade. Um, I am an artist and an organizer and an administrator. And I get into a lot of discussions about the pace of our interventions and innovations in communities. I know, having started a few things, that when I get the zeal to start something and I think it's a good idea, I don't just give lip service to consensus building, but I do get a little bit of, I get a little crazed and excited and ready to implement the idea. So the ongoing dialogue I have with myself is remember that consensus isn't stuck to the wall, that it's an ongoing thing, and how do you make sure to calibrate the pace of what you're doing with the community's desires and their invitation to do so therein. Um, I get in a lot of conversations with artists where <coughs> gentrification is this sort of guilty, um, we talk about it but we dance around it and we replace it with other words that rationalize our relationship to it and I personally think why here and why now, it's, it's a moment to kind of move that forward into some nuanced truths, plural. And with that, I would again like to introduce Risa Wilson who will talk to us first. Okay. Good evening. Ooh, yikes. Um, so this is a hard conversation to be in um, because I do think gentrification is one of those topics that's a very um, loaded, very hot button kind of topic. And so I don't pretend, I don't come into this conversation pretending to be an expert uh, on gentrification. It's not something I've studied or that this is what my professional work is around directly. Um, but before I talk about what the Laundromat Project is and how that's relevant to this conversation, as a human being, I think how I come into this conversation is someone who's lived in Bed-Stuy for the last, I guess, 12 years. Um, it's the neighborhood that my um, forebears came to when they migrated to the United States. Um, I lived down the street from the house that my mother was born in. It just so happens. Um, but I was raised in Philly. And so even though I've been here for a while, and even though I feel like I have deep roots in, in Bed-Stuy, I also understand myself as a gentrifier. Um, and I have to negotiate what my relationship is to privilege and what my relationship is to power. And how am I actually contributing to my community? How do I, how do I understand my community? How does my community understand me? Um, and so I think to live in this moment in New York, to live in this moment on the planet, is to is to um, kind of necessitates a very raw honesty about our individual relationships to privilege and power and access and what do we do with it. Um, that spills into my work um, in that I am very invested in what does it mean to be a citizen artist. So that's one of the questions I actually have for all of us that I hope that we'll wrestle with in our kind of Q&A. What does it mean to be a citizen artist? What does it mean to be a creative citizen, right? How do we tap into our own innate creative capacity in ways that actually manifest to create the places that we want to live, right? Um, and so understanding that the uh, infrastructure 
um, that would allow each of us as human beings to tap into that creativity in a very systematic way, in the way that we learn our ABCs, in the way that we learn our multiplication tables. That infrastructure um, is poor, um, is, has lots of holes in it, um, is not equitable, uh, is not ubiquitous. And so in that spirit, the laundromat project leverages the spaces of neighborhood laundromats to mount art programs, right? So that's just a really easy fallow space, downtime. But, but the fundamental skill is really how do we make it normal to tap into our creative capacity every day? How do we make it normal to be an artist? How, does it, how do we make it normal to be an artist and be a neighbor? Um, and to really understand what our individual responsibility is to the places where we live. Um, so the Laundromat Project mounts these art workshops um, that range from bookmaking to um, making kaleidoscopes to uh, silk screening to sidewalk drawings, but they always have some sort of um, curriculum attached to them that is about visioning around your particular neighborhood or understanding your particular neighborhood's history or understanding who actually lives here right now, what's their story. And so it's as much about um, meeting your neighbors, whether you are three or you are 83. Um, it's, you know, this kind of unexpected delight in seeing your neighborhood in a new light because it's also kind of like, what is this? Um, you know, not expecting that kind of that kind of moment to happen um, around the corner as opposed to these special buildings called museums, right? Or this special designated place as a place of culture. Um, but to understand really that it is part of our everyday lives and how do we make it manifest. Um, so I don't wanna kind of ramble on and on, but, but my own work, uh, whether it's with the Laundromat Project, which I founded and which is now led by a very capable team of really smart people, I sit on the board, um, whether it's through the Laundromat Project or the work I do every day at an organization called LINK, um, which is called, uh, stands for Leveraging Investments in Creativity, which itself is a 10-year project about strengthening the infrastructure of support for artists, right? So I'm kind of kind of say a little bit of my own answer to what does it mean to be a citizen artist and kind of my own answer to how do we live without money. You know, fundamentally, you have to have the capacity to pay your bills and to kind of understand, to make housing choices that aren't just about desperation, but that are actually about, uh, and that aren't just about buildings, but are about who lives here and how do I want to be part of this collection of people? What is it that I want to give? And what am I taking away? What's the exchange that happens? Um, and so I think the work at Link really pulls up that artists are fundamentally human beings, they are fundamentally professionals, and that there, there are universal needs around access to affordable health care and you know, access to affordable places to live and work, just like any other profession. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Reese. I um, also forgot to mention the, a little bit about the format. So uh, each of the panelists are going to talk for a few minutes, uh, tell you what's on their mind on this theme. But we're going to uh, move into the Q&A pretty early. We have until 8.30 here, so another hour and 10 minutes. And I, I want to, to the best of our ability, uh, break down kind of the divide between the days and, and the audience. And so please do think of questions and things you want to talk about. And I hope we really turn it into a conversation after these initial uh, presentations. So with that, I'd like to move on to Paula Siegel to tell us a little bit about her work. Let's see. Hi, um, my name is Paula Siegel. I run a little project called 596 Acres, which sort of in a head-on way tackles the space of the city. Um, and I have to admit that the word gentrification itself actually makes me a little bit uncomfortable because it speaks to so many different experiences at the same time. Um, and I really, I really liked what Risa said <laughs> um, about, about sort of interrogating your neighborhood based on the lens of who lives here now. And um, so what 596 Acres does is identify vacant public land and put tools in the hands of the people who live closest to that land, meaning vacant lots that are scattered around the neighborhoods of New York City, put tools in the hands of the people who live closest to those vacant lots to open up the fences and turn those vacant lots into places where neighbors can meet each other. Um, and the question of gentrification is one that's really loaded in that context. 
um, the reason a lot of these lots are vacant is because the gentrification that was anticipated in the 70s and 80s didn't happen the way that policymakers thought that it would. The city took a lot of land in, through urban renewal programs and actually, and also ended up with a lot of land through disinvestment, which came from, you know, basically insurance policies for how mortgages were insured. Just redlining is, is the word that we're all sort of familiar with. And what we're seeing still is how redlining has affected neighborhoods 40 years later. The people who live in those neighborhoods now are not, for the most part, the people who lived in those neighborhoods before disinvestment. Those people left. A lot of whoever could left. The situations that were created at that time were pretty desperate. Municipal services were cut and then the different people came in and these spaces in neighborhoods are the spaces where people who live in these places now can meet each other. And some people have been here the whole time. Some people moved into these neighborhoods in a sort of a moment of a desperate housing choice. Um, and some people are move, moved in last week. But it's everybody who's here now. And um, our, my hope for the project is that it creates spaces where people can meet their neighbors and together build the city. And the, the perspective on gentrification that I think is the most exciting to me is um, kind of taking it as a question of who decides and gentrification being, in my mind, something that is a decision that's made from the top down, a decision that's made on the level of policy and really wanting to turn that around. <coughs> so I like to talk about the work that we do as work that's anti-displacement, that's work that creates bonds in neighborhoods um, and creates the power and the capacity in the community to fight dis future displacements. Um, but the question of sort of gentrification is one of real perspective of like, are you a policymaker? Are you a new neighbor? Are you somebody who's watched their, your neighborhood change in ways that are good, in ways that are terrible, in ways that are threatening? Um, that word encompasses all of those things. And it's, it's interesting to parse, but I don't like to use it. So that's um, I'll give some thoughts in between everyone and uh, Paula just triggered or signaled me to you know that we've started the unpacking of gentrification um, I didn't select the title globalization and gentrification but I am happy with it because I, it gives me the opportunity to to, to um, really be in a research phase. I am in the process of starting a project in the city of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And this event tonight is one in a series of events that we're having in major cities around the world leading into that project. And so I'm in this really lucky position of working with the Brooklyn Museum to have this panel and to get to sit back and listen. And the reason I am glad that those two words got together in the title is because in some ways it feels like they are, they're very similar um, phenomena. And since I've been working in Brazil of late, I've heard this other word that sort of fits right in between them, which is called Brazilianification. And so if globalization is the, the world and if gentrification is the city, Brazilianification is defined as the state of the disappearing middle class and the broadening gap between the rich and the poor. Um, Brazil's a country that has five classes, or, or so they uh, stratify. And um, so just so you know what I'm up to by doing this convening and, and sitting back and listening. Um, with that, um, I know that Mitty is going to pick up on this policy theme, but also tell us a little bit of story about his life. So I'm going to hand it over to him now. Hi, thanks, Todd. Um, so, wow, when Todd gave us uh, this topic and the different iterations, it was big enough already, and then entering into the space and hearing your questions and hearing my co-panelists, it's, it's even more huge. And so I wear a number of different hats um, most of the time, and tonight I'm going to start with my party promoter hat because I want to invite you all to, for the after party at my place, which is fortunately is just about eight blocks away, because we're never going to end this conversation <laughs> by 8.30 in a meaningful way, because it's so rich, there's so much. So um, I'm sort of serious about that, but if not tonight, then let's definitely have a follow-up. 
Um, maybe I'll start, um, I mean, I, I, I have been an organizer. I've also been a public policy person in a few different ways, including teaching at NYU's Wagner School. And uh, I liked often to start my classes at NYU Wagner with a story about how it is that um, my family uh, developed some economic security and how we have, have been able to live just a, a mere eight blocks away. Um, in short, um, my, my folks came to the city in 1959. The city was obviously a very different place, right? This was now, the continue, at that point, the continuation of four decades of a black migration from the south and a more recent uh, major migration of people from the Caribbean to Brooklyn. Uh, at the same time, there was an exodus of the white middle class and working class from Brooklyn as a result of racial prejudice, um, the fears being fanned by capitalist speculators who wanted to blockbust, um, basically buying up brown, beautiful brownstones very cheaply and turning them into apartments and, and basically preying on people's fears. And let's not also forget the federal government incentivizing people to leave the city, incentivizing some people to leave the city by building highways in the suburbs and new developments like Levittown and not only the highway infrastructure, but then enticing them with very affordable mortgages and the insurance. And, um, and so a lot of people were fleeing, people who could go there without getting crosses burned on their lawns. Um, and so the city was a very different place. Home ownership was declining, city services were declining, the tax base was declining. And yet still, some people had the vision to see how incredible these neighborhoods were. The architecture, the streetscape, um, the incredible warmth of families, the community, despite the odds. And that is the world in which my parents entered. And after being renters and you know, frugally saving, um, and, and uh, my mom uh, dutifully combing the streets with my oldest brother in the stroller, she found a house on Prospect Place between Vanderbilt and Carlton and said, oh my God, we have to have this. Well, it was only eight blocks away from Grand Army Plaza where my dad had become a, library, a librarian, one of the first black librarians. He was making 7,000 at the time, 1959. They were both educated, they did the right thing, they were on that American dream trajectory, and they had heard that mortgages were being provided at 80%, so only 20% down. Even they, with their meager savings, could manage that at the 13,000 level, right? 20% down. Except when they looked into it more closely, those 80% loans were being made out in the new developments in Levittown, in the suburbs, because those were the federally insured mortgages that, for the, to the banks that were made at 80%. And the, back here in the inner city, with our existing infrastructure and beautiful brownstones, but which didn't quite make the federal government's guidelines of large lots, single family detached homes, and homogeneous communities. That was actually codified in the Federal Housing Administration's guidelines until 1962 when JFK uh, got rid of that through an executive order. Though, so in the inner city, you could only get a 50% loan. So suddenly my folks had to come up with 6,500 bucks, nearly my father's annual salary. Not exactly very possible for most new couples, except my mom, so, so, so many families just had to give up, despite the hard work, despite pulling themselves up by the bootstraps. The dream of home ownership was not achievable for them, which is, of course, had been the pathway to economic stability and upward mobility in the United States. Except, what I haven't told you is not only is my mom, who's sitting right here in the audience, who asked the first question about <laughs> <laughs> How do you live without money? Um, the troublemaker. Not only is she persistent, but she's white. And as a result of being white and having the historic white privilege, her family had something more than what most black families had. She was able to turn to her brother and say, please, he was a pharmacist, please lend me some money for this down payment. And he said, what? You don't know what you're doing. Everyone is leaving. No one wants to live there. But she's also, like I said, persistent and the younger sister. And she broke down and cried to her older brother. So our economic development, economic security, asset development strategy in this family, which led to our college educations and my father's financing of his professional aspirations, is not due to enlightened public policy or good bank policy, but the precariousness of having a white relative with some historic privilege and resources 
and her being a younger sister who was able to cry to her brother. Is that, is that what we want to hang our economic security and asset development strategies, strategies on in this country? Do we want that to be our guiding principles, or do we want enlightened public policies that will do what the New Deal did, which in five years, from 1936 to 1941, doubled the rate of home ownership as the result of enlightened federal policy, the Federal Housing Administration insuring mortgages again to certain people, working with the banking system, and doubling home ownership rates, not to mention all the other incredible programs of the New Deal. I will stop there, but I put that out there because one of the first questions I asked my students, I was tempted to ask you all tonight to, to even stand up in response to this question is, do you have any confidence that government can truly impact gentrification and other such social issues in a major way? Does gov is government even relevant to those phenomena as opposed to all the individualist, behavioralist, social interactions that we tend to focus so much on, which are not insignificant. But as we talk about gentrification, I hope as we get further into this discussion, we will, of course, talk further about the personal responsibility, the role of artists and creative individuals, and the role of civic organizations, and how we address our personal consciousness and our personal responsibility, how we dialogue, how we have respect for our, these communities and, and interact. But there's something even deeper than that which is how do we have more enlightened public policy which sets the foundation because globally, going back to globalization, there is a global phenomenon indeed, as Todd said, and that is the concentration of wealth in the hands of very few and the denial, the, the reduced democracy, certainly in this country, of the many to be able to control our resources, our communities, and our politics. It all goes together. So I hope we will be able to come back to these myriad themes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mitty. Um, Mitty, could you please run for mayor? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <All right. laughs> he, he is from a, a family of politicians, ah. I believe. Uh, yeah. Sir, before I give you okay. the, the mic, may I say just a few more sure. announcements? I, and I'll admit, this is not by design. I should have said some of these things before everyone started, but I was so anxious to get into the discussion. and. It also shouldn't be overlooked that last night we had part one of this two-part event at a gallery in Manhattan where visual artists Nikki Singleton and Brian Halloran responded to Sarah's book, Gentrification of the Mind, with an installation and performance. And that has kept us up for uh, the last three nights. Uh, so uh, some of it is actually me being forgetful. Um, but uh, what I would like to point out before Sarah starts is that my uh, my math, my counting on four fingers here, says that everyone on the, on the table is an artist. Uh, I know at least Mitty is a drummer, whether or not he takes it any further than that. And I've heard so far the first three uh, talks really sort of leaning into administration and policy. So I hope that I can ask the audience to help me suss out the artistry and the art practice of the folks here at the table. Uh, I'd also like to mention that we have a class who's uh, on winter uh, intercession at CUNY from the Pacific School of Religion. So at the very least, I hope those students will help me ask those questions. And before Sarah starts, I want to also give a plug for her book that Gentrification of the Mind tonight, if you would like to have it, there is a 20% off coupon on the back table and you can order it with that discount. And um, I'll start uh, to introduce Sarah by saying that in her book, um, she says that gentrification is a process that hides the apparatus of domination from the dominant themselves. And uh, with that, I'll give it to you, Sarah. Okay, so I want to tell the same story that you told, but a little bit differently. Here's my version of the history of gentrification in New York City. World War II, they had the GI Bill. And the GI Bill enabled veterans to buy homes with very, very low interest rates. But because of, and this was actually a way for the government to put money directly into the hands of developers who were developing the suburbs. So it was a government policy to funnel federal funds into the hands of developers. Because of race, racism and racial discrimination, these suburbs were not available to veterans of color. So this is what motivated what later became known as white flight. The movement of ethnic whites out of the city into these suburbs. And these suburbs were racially stratified. 
They, had, they were very conservative arenas, privatization, compulsory heterosexuality, car culture, consumerism, highly, highly stratified cultures in which those former urban citizens were now raising their children in an opposite environment from the environments they had grown up in. The city that was left behind, the city of white flight, was a city of low rents, of open neighborhoods. I know my parents paid $60 a month and got three months free rent for signing their lease. Okay, so it was that kind of environment, but don't forget that it also was the environment of urban rebellion, and in the 60s and 70s. Now, movements like black power and gay liberation were not created in the suburbs. They were created in the cities because they required that mix that is the, the life force of urbanity. It required people of difference living together to produce new ideas. And that's why cities were essential places for revolutionary ideas and for revolutionary art ideas. And ideas that in the 60s and 70s were extremely threatening to the dominant culture and had a lot of impact on social transformation. Now in the mid 70s, New York City went broke. The, the, the explanation that we were given was that there were not enough rich people living here, we didn't have a tax base to sustain the payment for the city, and so the deliberate process of gentrification began. Gentrification is not a normal evolution. It was a deliberate process, and you must keep that in mind. And it was sold to the people of New York City with the claim that by attracting richer people we would have a broader tax base and we'd be able to afford the infrastructure. I don't know if you looked at our infrastructure lately. New York City is overflowing with rich people and we are closing hospitals, our schools are shit, the subways don't work, right? None of this money has gone into the infrastructure because of the Reagan tax cuts. So we brought in all of these rich people and none of the money is going back into the city. Now, what they did was they started to do condo and co-op conversion um, with the idea of attracting who? the children of white flight. And I think that this is really an important part of the cultural shift that accompanies gentrification. For me, gentrification is a supremacy ideology that is masquerading as reality. It does not see itself. Okay, it looks in the mirror and thinks it's a window. And it is very, it has a lot of the, the basic qualities of white supremacy and it's very connected to white supremacy. So, so children of the white flight generation, they had a, a sentimental and emotional attachment to the city because their parents had grown up there. They would come here to visit their grandparents. They'd, take the, they'd come into the city to walk around and smoke pot or whatever. They had a relationship to the city. But they had grown up in racial stratification. They had grown up in class stratification. They did not have a comfort with urbanity. And so when these people were attracted back into the city, they brought suburbanization with them, suburbanized values and suburban culture. And this was the first time in America that we had suburbanization. It was the first time that we had produced a generation that was a product of suburbanization. And with them, they brought certain values. They brought the value of the gated community. They brought the willingness to trade freedom for security. They brought a sense of um, obedience that was contrary to urban life. And so you start to see as the city through corporate welfare, which is what it was, okay, tax breaks to wealthy developers. This, as the city started to bring these people in, there started to be a flip in the perspective of how things were assessed. So for example, a neighborhood that was now becoming dangerous to its inhabitants was called safer. Right? Because it's not from the point of view of the inhabitants. When a neighborhood became homogenous, it's called better. But actually, it's worse. So what starts to happen in New York City, and the reason I've called this book the gentrification of the mind, is that the homogeneity undermines urbanity. And therefore, the city becomes less and less a place that produces new ideas. And you know, what's really interesting is I realized um, very last night, actually, that the word gentrification has a different meaning for, for more recent arrivals to New York and younger people than it does for me. For me, gentrification is a replacement process. It's an undermining of diverse, 
businesses and mixed communities that are affordable and a replacement with a bland and boring and banal homogenous suburban aesthetic that weirdly views itself as hip and cool when it's actually incredibly tedious. <laughs> but that's not what gentrification means to people today. To them it means they see all of that homogeneity as neutral and as the way things are. And when those places get replaced by Dunkin' Donuts and banks and McDonald's, that's what they're calling gentrification. But what's actually happening is that low-income people have no place to buy anything. So they're being forced into these fast food chains and these, um, you know, the kind of things that, you know, Dunkin' Donuts, these types of places, because the places that New Yorkers found affordable and expressed their culture in were already were destroyed. So that's where I see that we're at now. So, um, okay, that's it. That's it. Well, I, <laughs> I'm watching both Mitty and Risa sort of write furiously. I can't see the tablets of Sarah and Paula, but I think that there's some reaction. Um, I, before we get to that, I, I would like to ask the panelists to converse amongst themselves a bit, to ask each other questions for the next 10 or so minutes while the audience is gearing up with their questions. But I thought I would, uh, I thought I would give them a time to gather their thoughts and read you a quote that I stumbled across and am still thinking about and want you to think about it too. I have not read the book Telegraph Avenue by Michael Chabon, but I did read a review about it in the American Reader. And this is a passage that has stuck with me. I have nothing against Michael Chabon, by the way. Um, <clears throat> Michael Chabon cannot help but fall into the trap <clears throat> Pierre Bordeaux, in distinction, ascribes to the Neradniki of all times and all lands, that of confusing one's relation to the working class condition with the working class relation to that condition. What this means for Chabon is that the research process itself infiltrates the fabric of the object of research. It installs itself as the grand narrative, meta, excuse me, as the grand metaphor behind all other activities in an endless series of knowledge checks, culture checks, and taste checks. Now, why I wanted to read that is as, um, as a culture worker, as an artist, as a sometimes Per, you know, person with an idea that I want to activate quickly, this slows me down. And um, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about tonight was what slows you down? What, um, how do you make sure, and this is a question to the panel, how do you make sure that you are working in tandem with the communities you're working in and not outpacing them uh, with the added value that I believe everyone at this table is making? Um, I'll start with Risa. I, I met Risa um, some eight, nine, <laughs> ten years ago, I guess, uh, right when um, the laundromat, before I think you, you proposed the laundromat project, and I remember when it kind of got off mm -hmm. the ground and when I believe it was, it was inten the intention was that it would be one laundromat that the project would purchase and that the, the income would cross-subsidize the artistic activities. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably simplifying that, but I think that in the meantime, you've moved into a sort of scaling out of that idea where rather than immediately purchasing a property that you're actually engaging autonomous laundromats with your idea. And in some way that speaks to the pacing question I'm asking where mm -hmm. I see that you have actually opted to work in more than one neighborhood and not take sort of a capital um, expense on as a project manager. Mm -hmm. I'll just leave it at that and see if you have anything to anyone's re remarks you'd like to say. I would love to tell you that that was out of some very deliberate strategic what have you, but I think it really does reflect a lot of what has been pulled up, right? Which is, um, you know, uh, our policies, our structures have not been designed for people of color, women of color, without a lot of money, to go buy a building to go be a commercial landlord, to go, I mean, that's, that's more the reality than, um, you know, this very strategy. thoughtful strategy, <laughs> but it was kind of like, all right, well, fuck you, I'm gonna do something. So, you know, if I can't buy a building, you know, if you, if you won't front the money to buy the building, if you won't be an investor, um, then let me get on with the work, which is really fundamentally about how do we reach people where they are, and how do we, and, and so it's a happy accident, right? So the, the happy accident is, um, 
we are now uh, figuring out what's available, um, the kinds of conversations that can happen, the kind of cultural shifts that can happen um, because we are working in multiple neighborhoods. And so I want to pull up something that you brought at MIDI, which is really right on. You know, I, I think, and actually you also pulled it up, Sarah, right? Like, it's important for us to hold our government accountable and for our policies and structures to be designed for us to actually live the way that we want to live. That's, that's real, right? And it's important that we don't take on more responsibility than is appropriate personally. And at the same time, I also think that um, cultural shifts are what produce lasting change, right? Um, it's, it's what what makes people angry about policies that don't work. It's what produces, it's, it's all the dynamics that you're pulling up, right, about how we imagine something different. And I think that there's, there's a reason why there are many people that are complacent with the kind of guilty elephant of, I know I'm a gentrifier. And I think, you know, we have to own our agency in upholding the effects of these policies, right? So how do we get honest about negotiating what access to power we have and how we're exercising it, um, whether that means that we, you know, those of us who have the capacity to advocate for different policies are doing that, whether that is those of us who are cultural workers who want to see some sort of difference, um, are thoughtful about the, the way that we invite someone to consider what we're doing and understand it as a proposal and not my inherent right to do this just because I live here and this is my address, um, to just, I think culture is very real, and so I'm really interested in how we negotiate um, the, the happy marriage of the two, of these kind of cultural shifts and structural shifts at the same time. I, I might take a crack at <laughs> uh, chiming in here. Um, there clearly is no, um, uh, there's no dichotomy here. Um, obviously between the culture slash personal slash community level and the policy, quote unquote, because good policy is only formulated and implemented, there's a big difference, when the people who are most affected are somehow at the table or involved, or involved whether it's at the local level or whether it's a national health care bill, right? When we are truly at the table and we have more control over it, then we will get the policies we want. Otherwise, we'll get something. If we get something, we'll get something terribly watered down or missing the mark. So one of, one of the questions that was going through my brain for the two of you, uh, Risa and, and Paula, was, is thinking about how you all, are you able to use the public spaces that you have or private spaces that you then are able to transform into public space, which is so fantastic, and then the, and the, and then the public lots. To, to facilitate dialogue, community dialogue about issues and how, what is that process like? Especially in a country where, and I've traveled a lot and I've, I've never seen such almost disdain for sort of political discussion as in this country in many ways. I, that, that's not totally fair because actually I find on the, on the more grassroots level, I find people do naturally go into talking about politics in an organic way, issues that affect them in their daily lives. So I, I really take that back. Um, so what is that process like? Is there a discussion about deep, meaningful things and, and a, an orientation towards, yes, we can use this space and this dialogue to, through the creativity, through the public space, to organize, mobilize, put together an agenda. Does that transform into taking power and taking action? I mean, this, this kind of goes to the mechanics of how 596 acres works, um, but it continues to stun me. So there is a lot of land in this city, maybe not quite 596 acres when you actually look at it very closely, but a lot of land in this city that's being held onto by the city in a sort of land bank that's designed to give land away to future speculators that have not you know, arrived yet at a moment where they want to speculate in the areas where the city is just holding on to this land, and land that's being held, that was acquired by public actors for public projects that never happened. That land is kind of invisible. 
It's sitting behind fences. It looks just like any other lot that's being warehoused by a speculator. It's got trash on it. There's probably a dead cat. You know, it, it, it looks that way. Um, and simply labeling it, simply putting a sign on it, with like an arrow and a phone number that says, hey, this is what our government is doing. This is what our very local government is doing. And here's the person that's, the person you can call who's accountable for this lot full of trash and the dead cat. That actually starts a conversation that surprises me by cutting across a lot of personal politics and then coming back and starting at a really political place. It's a real accountability place and it's neighbors talking to each other with this one piece of information that's really solid and lets people take the next step as well. And what's, I've been doing this for about a year and a half in the way where I work with people from all over where, wherever the land is. Um, and what surprises me is how much I see over and over again in these different groups, some of which I haven't even met. I, I, you know, I sometimes we'll get an email or see something, how much they're suddenly engaging with their community boards, their local council races. People are asking questions that are super mechanical about how civic associations work, how government works, how money is distributed in the city. For people to be able to talk across difference um, and ask real inquisitive questions instead of political questions about how how government structures our lives. I think figuring out ways to do that is really, really important. And what we have is like this one little key that turns one little lock that lets that happen. And if we could do that everywhere, I think we would have we would have real accountability. We'd have real demand for accountability. Uh, I think Todd mentioned earlier that I was involved. I am involved in bringing street law programs to youth around New York City. Um, I'm actually trained as an attorney, and I've spent some time working for a civil rights firm. And in law school, we actually set up a system so that anybody who's a teacher or works at a community-based organization can have a centralized way of saying, hey, I'd like a law student or an attorney to come and do a street law training that's a harm reduction training in constitutional rights and how to deal with police encounters. Um, and setting up that infrastructure also is another way. There are no answers, and when you show up in a, you know, a ninth grade classroom to talk about how you know, a particular neighborhood is over-policed and how particular individuals could maybe protect themselves in those encounters, you're not gonna stop stop and frisk. And you're not gonna stop the violence of those interactions in people's lives. But you're gonna start conversations that maybe have never happened before. You're gonna start conversations in spaces that are neutral, where, pe where there is difference where people have really different experiences based on their color of their skin, based on where they live in the city, and to be able to have those conversations about something else that's like, wow, why do the police stop people? And to start that, to be able to start those conversations, again, little tiny key, but it's building a constituency. That's sort of me talking about me. But. <laughs> I just want to talk a little bit about the gentrification of the arts, which is a big factor in all of this. Um, you know, the, the, I, I think that the, the proliferation of MFA programs and the professionalization of the arts has had very significant consequences on gentrification. Um, if you, now that basically you're required to get an MFA if you want to have a professional career. If you want to teach in your field, you have to have an MFA. And it's, it operates as a, um, you know, it's, a, it's like a gang system, right? Um, so, everyone, so the other people who have your brand, whether your brand, you know, whatever your school is, that's your gang and that's your brand. And those other people with that brand will help you and that's how you advance. Now there's so, the, the, this all produces homogeneity for a number of reasons. The first thing is a community does not have an entrance requirement, right? Anybody can be in a community. But if you have to apply and be accepted into a professionalization program, they're already filtering you. So they want a certain type of person. And you also have to be able to pay, right? right. And we know that these things are grossly, I mean, the idea that somebody pays $200,000 to get an MFA in poetry is really <laughs> crazy, okay. 
So now you've been filtered in. You're the kind of person that they want, and you have the money, or you're willing to go away into debt, and you have the time. So already, most people who would have become artists without those conditions are not going to go into that system. Then you come in, and you have common influences. You're reading the same books. You're listening to the same teachers. Right? This is counterindicated to art making itself. Art making is about individual vision. And you know, before this professionalization was imposed, you became an artist by making art, looking at art, and talking about art, basically, with other artists. And each person had their own path through life, and you would eclectically acquire information or, or be exposed to things or read some book or whatever, and each person develops their own points of reference, and it becomes their vision. But when you systematize it and you make it mandatory, then you have very, very narrow range of work that gets created with shared vocabulary and values that are class-based and mostly racially based and repetitive. And this is just killing the arts in New York City. I mean, it is, you know, sometimes like, I'm a novelist and sometimes I'll sit on a panel or something and I'm looking at, and you can tell what program people went to by how they write. I mean, it's so mass-produced. Um, and I want to say that I want to go back to Peter's question, which I think is really important about why here right now. Why now? And I think it's because the gentrification discourse is itself becoming gentrified. You know, one of the things about capital is that it's able to absorb everything. You know, and as soon, and I've had this experience, I'm old, I'm 54, and I've had this experience multiply that you, you do cultural activism, you discover something, you develop it, you articulate it, and as soon as it becomes viable, they swoop in and take it from you. And even the gentrification discourse itself is being branded and marketed. So that's why, you know, here and now. Thank you. Um, okay, so Sarah did kind of get to the art of it all, but uh, we still need to hear from Paula, uh, Risa, and Midi about their own artistic practices. So I'm going to leave that to the audience because we're pretty swiftly going to segue to um, Q&A because I'd really like to hear what you all are thinking and what this has provoked in you. Before the video changes, because I think that's what's about to happen, let me tell you what you've been watching and what you're about to watch. So the slideshow right now is a, uh, a mix between some images from 596 Acres and some images from a, a walk I took in Sao Paulo with a photographer photographing lanchonettes. Um, and I just thought I'd share with you a little bit of my passion. Uh, Paula is also a, a fellow lover of Sao Paulo, I believe, um, knowing her work there. The next slideshow you're about to see is from Housing as a Human Right. It's an organization based here in New York, I believe. Risa has helped us get uh, a slideshow movie of some images, and they go pretty slow, so we'll put them on as the backdrop for um, the Q&A. And Todd, could I just interject about sure. your project, because I watched a video that you have online about your project, and one of the things that, I was, that was so intriguing um, for me about the Luncheonette project is I believe you said that the luncheon in, 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 in Sao Paulo, which is rapidly changing and gentrifying, that the luncheonettes are one of the few remaining spaces which were publicly accessible and attracted a cross-class okay. group of people. So you'd have various people sitting there, and that was one of the few spaces that really facilitated that interaction. Right. I guess laundromats, one, one could say, right. in, 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 in changing neighborhoods could also do that. Um, so, although obviously the, the very rich don't have to go to the laundromats, but luncheonettes, everyone needs to eat, and they eat out. So that was intriguing for me, because otherwise I was wondering why the luncheonette and, and right. that, that particular space as a, as, a, as a place that facilitates that interaction is, uh, in, in, in a changing demographic is curious to me. You gave me a wonderful setup. I've promised that I'm not going to belabor the Lunch on That project too much because it's a five-year project that just started, and I'm still in a really uh, exploratory mode with it. But I will say that there are postcards on the back table if you'd like to read a little bit about it, and I will speak to that very briefly because I think it's germane to what we're talking about. I make the argument, or, or maybe the hypothesis, I'm not sure yet. I don't want to be too academic with the project, but I say that in a particular area of the center of Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo being a vast space unlike, say, Rio, where the favelas are in the mountains, and so 
poor live on top of rich. In Sao Paulo, it's vast and wide, and so the poor live at the periphery. But there still remains a center of the city that is, let's say, ungentrified, and it is slowly being squeezed out and pushed to the periphery. And this includes all of the uh, South and Latin American diaspora communities, Bolivians, Haitian communities in the center, the big marketplace. And it's an old architecture. So my argument is, is that even though the lanchonette is ubiquitous in the, the city and in the country, there are thousands, they're like our bodega, the architectural design of the lanchonette in the center, which is changing, are open front and or open corner, meaning that in some cases two walls are removed where you really can walk through the corner and be in a lanchonette. So it's, I'm not hyper-focusing on one lanchonette, but really just the symbolism of here's this space where you do still get the brushing of elbows of different classes, taking their coffees, taking their vitamina uh, juices in the morning, uh, watching a football match, etc. So please pick up the card. And um, a couple more plugs before we switch to the Q&A. I know that uh, Paula has a book that's on the back table or maybe on the front table from the 596 acre project. It is for sale for $10. And if you happen to have one, please don't forget to pay her. And um, with that, are we ready to talk? Do we have questions already? Um, I see Karen Atlas at first. I see some other hands. Here's the deal. Please do not talk for a long time. Like, ask, you know, <laughs> ask a question. I'm also going to apologize to this side of the room. I'm a little bit like Barbara Streisand in the sense that this is the side I want to be filmed. <laughs> I will turn around and I will see you. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to start with Karen Atlas's question, and um, we'll go from there. Thank you. I think we got a really good layout of how um, bad public policies get made in whether it's housing or culture, um, and the impact they have. I want to I want to hear about good progressive public policies, examples of them, how they happened, when they happened, what makes them happen, and how artists um, have and cultural organizers have been part of them, or if they haven't, um, why not? And we'll go one by one for now, and. And just anyone on the panel can answer to that. If we get uh, sort of jammed up, we'll take a few at a time, but we'll start with that. Um, I, I can take a crack. Um, well, I guess about two decades ago, Fort Greene, two decades, yeah, I guess two decades, um, Fort Greene really experienced a major renaissance um, from and by you know, the black community. Spike Shop came in. Was it 20 years ago or even more? Some more. Yeah, Spike Shop came in, 40 Acres and a Mule. Yeah. And, um, and then the whole development of the Bogolan, what was called the Bogolan District. I forget what that means, but it was an African word. Um, that really sparked this incredible renaissance in Fort Greene that for a long time was not only clearly black run. Uh, you know, black owned, I don't know if all the properties were owned, but certainly the shops were black owned. You had a flavor of African and Caribbean and black American shops, um, but um, was also very class diverse. Um, and that, I thought that was an incredible phenomena. And I don't know the full story. Um, I know there were a couple of individuals who were particularly active. I was actually not living in New York at the, at the time, but whenever I come back to visit, um, I, I always would go there to shop to support local black businesses. Um, I'd go to 4W Circle, bless Selma Jackson. She was certainly a, an anchor there. And that's a story which, does anyone know if that story has been written? It has not. It really needs to be. No, it's not. Oh, is there? Movie by Nelson George about it, okay. I believe it's called Brooklyn Bohem. Brooklyn Bohem. Is that right? Oh, I okay, just... good. So anyway, not, not, to, not, to, not to dwell too long, that you want to chime in on that? Yeah, yeah. Only, only to say that I think you're bringing up a really good point about the business district. So we've heard a lot around kind of the cultural renaissance of Fort Greene, but there was this very thriving small black business district that just was, was disappeared. Like when we talk about gentrification and you know, folks being displaced and being priced out, that had a very real concrete impact on the Fort Greene that we see now, right? So it's that, it's that both right. and. Right, and some of those businesses were able to hang in there, but you know, a lot of them were displaced. And actually, you know, it's interesting because obviously BAM is right around the corner, but in terms of the, the, that strip itself on Fulton, 
there was such richness culturally that even though I don't remember if there were art shops particularly, there, it, it always felt artistic and, and it was certainly culturally vibrant um, and, and very creative. And then, um, yeah, then the various you know, forces over the more recent years um, developing. Anyway, so let me just also mention that um, uh, you know, this, this is a different place, but, but certainly in, in New Orleans, post Katrina, there's been a lot of attention to the you know, nefarious forces wanting to really do a lot of gentrification and push a lot of folks out. And uh, there's been a group of artists along like the St. Claude Avenue strip that have really been an anchor at facilitating dialogue. And so everything that, that Sarah was saying about the arts from the, sort of a conceptual and intellectual framework, which I, I so appreciate in terms of independence and um, you know, a bulwark against the homogeneity and the commercialism, I totally agree with. There's also, of course, a more utilitarian approach uh, and role of, of the arts and, and artists, uh, facilitating in a creative way the dialogue, creating that space for people to come together in a safe way. Um, and a number of artists there and, and a theater there, a community theater, have facilitated that process to make sure that as they have improved the community and brought in, brought in better transportation, improved the housing stock, etc., that the people who have hung in there and been there, the indigenous businesses and, and residents, are not automatically pushed out. They still are concerned about that because you need rent control and, and, and stabilization, commercial and, rent, uh, and, and residential. Um, you need inclusionary zoning. You need a lot of different good public policies to ensure that those things don't happen. Um, before I take a question from this side, Karen, did you want to suggest something that you know of? Um, back to you, Karen Atlas. Um, is there something, an example of just the same question you asked? I mean, I think I, what I was trying to get at is that we spend a lot of our time talking against gentrification and less of our time talking about what are the public policies we want and what does affordable housing look like, what does the fight of artists alongside of people for affordable housing look like and I appreciate the New Orleans ex example. All right. Thank you. I, I'm going to give a little plug for Karen and speak to the participatory budgeting work that she's doing in her district as a culture worker extraordinaire. Thank you Karen for being here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go here. Tony Lester, um, no relation but a good friend. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, you know, one of the things I wish we'd tease out a little more is how you define artists, because um, listening, and uh, it's Sarah talking about there's being the suburbs in the city, and I was thinking, there's a way in which we're talking about artists as somebody separate and distinct from other people, almost like a professionalized way, somehow. And I'm thinking about, like, people, and my mind went to certain aspects of the black church and music and choir masters and you know the aesthetic of that which is spectacle and celebration and that is artistry to me but yet we're not really thinking about that when we talk about what's a cultural worker I mean it's kind of an abstraction that's really removes it from community and so for me it's the sense of that you know if you're going to talk about the history of when the artist was just someone who was functionally working in a community and not recognized as separate and distinct to now somebody's hauled up somewhere in some little loft, not making a lot of money, you know, maybe thinking of Langston Hughes, he was a busboy, you know, and so, that's an artist. So, so I, I, I like to tease out how, what, how, how are we defining what an artist is? What is the role of someone who's artistic but doesn't get recognized? And then I have to take a plug for the suburbs, <laughs> because there's arts going on all around the place, especially with black folks. It can't be denied wherever they're located. And so, and not, to, not so much a criticism, but just a kind of honoring of that. Um, I mean, I, I'll hop in not to define artists, right, because that's big, but, but I think your point is well taken around these labels and then who gets, who identifies with those labels and then how do they come to opportunities that are marketed towards artists with a capital A. Um, I, think, I think we and I have Laundry Project's hat on very deliberately and then I'll talk about Link as well. So we at the Laundry Project um, commission artists to do projects in their local laundromat 
but we're also very deliberate that it's, it's not about showing, um, it's not about showing your MFA credentials, right? It's really like, are you someone who lives in a neighborhood who has a creative capacity that you want to contribute and then can show that you have some track record of delivering on that, full stop, right? But you are absolutely right that even um, marketing something to artists, there, there's a particular body of people who understand themselves as that, and there are folks who, you know, do not. And that's kind of part of the work that we're really engaged in, is sort of how do we all, as everyday people, feel a sense of ownership around our creative capacity and, and have the boldness to decide that we want to identify ourselves with, you know, with the moniker of artists um, when the instance comes up. Link, as a national project, I think also has tried to, um, even though we are still working in some of the abstractions that you're talking about, has tried to talk about artists and cultural bearers. You know, so those things that are about tradition, that are about ritual, that may, you know, definitely are not necessarily about a kind of formal education, but are about a mastery, are about the things that happen from apprenticeship, that are about the informal. Um, and so not making um, the gateway, the ticket into this conversation being about, you know, show me your credentials, but really about, um, uh, you know, how, how much time do you invest in this craft? You know, what, what and not, also not even about are you earning a living from it, because you can be a professional artist and that does not mean that that is what pays the bills. That is, that's the reality for the majority of people who call themselves professional artists with a capital A. Um, so, yeah. Full stop. Okay, thank you. What I want to do now, and um, can, I'm going to... Can I chime in for one second? I'm sorry, sure. I'm, I know I'm saying a lot, but I'm chomping with a bit around that question. I'll try to make it brief, because a couple of months ago, I had a discussion with someone that prompted something. I, want, I believe in everything that Risa was saying. I want to take it a step further, because in thinking about broadening the definition of the arts and artists, I think we also need to broaden how we think about cultural preservation in communities. My daughter can go to all the Mark Morris African dance classes or you know, that, that, that might exist. That's not going to give her a strong sense of being a little black girl, right. right? So it is fantastic that we have cultural institutions, black owned, ethnically owned or not, that certainly do appreciate the culture, the diverse cultures of Brooklyn and offer these things. But if our funding and our focus is only on those cultural institutions as opposed to looking more deeply and profoundly at how is culture preserved? For any of you, Irish, Italian, Jewish, whatever, mm -hmm. how does your culture get inculcated in you and your children? It's not through just going to classes. I mean, that might be a piece of it, you know? And, and many Chinese folks go to Chinese class, language class, but even there, it's being surrounded by businesses and people and traditions you know, and so when you mentioned the church, and I'm not a churchgoer, but I certainly appreciate the role that the church plays in transmitting some fundamental things about black culture. I also think about the pan yard, the steel pan yards in Bed-Stuy, right? Mm -hmm. Those will go away. Those will not exist with the gentrification. Where will all the folks who produce the incredible carnival, where will they produce them? Will they have to go out to the suburbs and be pushed out in the outer boroughs, I mean, outer, outer areas, in order to be able to then come back in. They produce those if you go along Nostrand Avenue. That is a place where culture is retained and transmitted. What funder ever thinks about, hey, maybe I should fund some pan yards? Because that's keeping Caribbean children understanding what steel pan and, 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 and costume making and, and being from their countries is all about. Thank you, that's not at all part of the dialogue right now. Okay. Thank, thank you. I'm, I'm only feeding you because so, I, I want to get a lot of questions right. and we have 15 more minutes. I'm going to take three at a time over here, but before I do that, I'm going to reiterate, uh, Risa mentioned Link, that's leveraging investment and creativity. Uh, the best pan yard I know is at the corner of Tompkins and Fulton. <laughs> um, the film that was mentioned back here, Brooklyn Bohem, about Fort Greene, and there's another one, My Brooklyn, that's more recent about the moving of the mall out of the downtown. And now I'd like to take three people whose first names I don't know, um, if you'll just put your question on the table and we'll get the, the panelists to respond all at once, uh, just in any order. Cool. Hi. Thank you so much for the conversation. Um, he started off by asking, like, how do we live with money? And um, I'm just wondering if it's useful to, like, 
have a conversation about gentrification and also globalization without talking about capitalism and capital. And Sarah, you briefly mentioned like the idea of capital, and so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that and money, and if it's just reached the point of this like totality that we don't feel we have the liberty or freedom or language to like think outside of that and, and how we can imagine outside of that. Thank you. One more person. Uh, Hi, thank you guys so much. Um, so you talked a lot about the gentrification of the arts, but in the past few years there's been a real rise in this uh, phenom phenomenon of crowdfunding, most notably with Kickstarter, which uh, really fuels independent creative arts projects. So I was just wondering if you guys could speak to that, do you know about it, are you cynical, optimistic, skeptical? And that's all. Okay, so I, I didn't hear the, the first question of the second person, but I did hear the first question of the first person about um, living with money, and I heard uh, the next question of how do we motivate neighborhoods, so I'll hand that to whoever wants it. Uh, kind of, it doesn't matter how much arts funding there is if it all goes to the same people. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. It's Kickstarter. Yep. <laughs> And that's kind of Kickstarter, right? Like, if you come from a community of privilege, you're going to get your project funded. And if you don't, then you're going to ask your friends and they're going to say, that's really cool, I wish I could give you some money. Um, and that sort of, that worries me a lot about Kickstarter. Um, and that's the thing that, we're a, really, we're a really, really young organization that's trying to figure out how to sustain itself um, and trying to figure out whether we should be trying to sustain ourselves or whether we've, we're sort of, you know, maybe we're done with this because maybe we've planted this seed and now we get to go do something else. We're at that point. I'm not asking you guys for advice. Uh, but <laughs> the, the Kickstarter thing is, is real. It's like, okay, so how do you leverage privilege? How do you leverage access to information? Um, we try to do that as a practice in terms of what we're actually doing, but in terms of sustaining ourselves and how do you live with money or without money, which is what I thought your email said, actually. And I was surprised to hear it the other way. Um, it's really, really complicated. And it seems like it's much easier, um, I'm starting to learn about foundation funding, it's much easier to get funding for something that seems productive in that capitalist realm, if you can say like, we're gonna, this community's gonna get 500 pounds of kale that it didn't have before, and that makes a lot more sense, or an art opening of this artist that never heard of this place before, that makes a lot more sense, then there's gonna be a place where people can meet each other. And that kind of falls flat in the foundation world where there's, you know, it kind of, what's the product? So even when you get outside of talking about money, this like indus industrial production, industrial food production, even on the small scale, all of these value judgments are really embedded in the way we decide whether things are worth doing. Um, I just wanted to respond since you, you called me out by name. How do you motivate neighborhoods? I don't think you have to. I think for, re for really and truly, if you say to people, here is a space, and as long as you all work together, you can do whatever you want here. That is, that's motivation enough. Thank you. Yeah. I'll take three more questions if there are them. Can, uh, can I, could you be quick with them? Just, three, okay, three try, I'll, I'll try to be brief. So, so when I think about like how the arts can contribute to facilitating that dialogue, like I think about on an organic level certainly, but also like Mokada having the ex exhibition on gentrification a few years ago, which sparked a whole lot of dialogue and they actually brought it out into the community and had pictures in the community. So I think that's a great example. Sparked dialogue, didn't provide easy answers. Um, and linking the first question and the last question, the capitalism with the Kickstarter, and I, I think that's essentially what you were doing, there, there are fundamental issues of privilege and access. And it's, it, what, what has happened to society is that we're on such a treadmill, the 99% of us, simply to keep our heads above water that most of us, even though we're creative and brilliant or whatever, do not have the means to develop our creative talent. They're brilliant doctors, Do scientists, poets, whatever, but we are working for the man just to pay for the rents, the rapidly escalating rent, the health insurance, et cetera. And so when I look around, there's less social mobility in the United States today than there was in the 1920s. When I look around me and I see those people who are doing really creative, funky stuff, and they're actually surviving off of that, 
they're basically living off of subsidy. And I'm not putting it down. If they got that means, great. They're living off a trust fund, they're living off their parents, whatever, that's great if they can do it. But the fact is that let's recognize that there are all such other people out here who are just as creative who are not, don't have those social networks to be able to, to fund their creative ideas. It's sad. Great. Thank you, Mitty. Um, can I get a, a show of hands with questions, please? <laughs> wow. Okay, what I'd like to do is if you'll keep it to 15 seconds or so, I'd like to just go straight through all the questions and get them on the table so that we have them before the closing remarks. So whoever has, here? pardon? Can we start back here? So, uh, yeah, start, move across the room, but really please briefly, or we won't get through everyone. Um, I'm wondering what you think the role of the church is or could be in this. I think that when we think about changing neighborhoods, churches have often survived, whether or not that's because they're supported mm -hmm. from the top down or not, mm -hmm. but they're also large physical footprints. So what kind of partnerships do you think could develop? Which excellent examples have you seen? What is the role of the church? Thank you. Yes, uh, what do you think is the role and potential of social media, specifically Facebook and Twitter, and is there a Tahrir Square of anti-gentrification in New York City? So just keep your hand up so she sees you as she's moving closer. Hi, um, I'd love for the AIDS crisis to be brought in, um, particularly through Sarah and anybody else, of course. Um, being, and I think it also relates to uh, Tony's question about what makes an artist because the AIDS crisis decimated a whole generation of creative people. Certainly most of them, a lot of them didn't have MFAs. And um, being 51, holding a place on 14th Street in the East Village, this is a, and a long-term survivor. The homogenization of gay culture, I think, is tremendously tragic. Thanks, Eric. Um, uh, my name is Andrew Bedia, and I've done a lot of work in East Harlem along issues of gentrification um, with a project called El Barrio Tours. And the, the biggest struggle I had was how to communicate. How do you communicate um, to white liberals who might look at uh, a community that they're just moving into and be completely, you know, out of their element? How do you communicate to them, understand they are part of this community? How do you establish a relationship with them and work with them to move forward? The second thing is then how to work with my own community as a Puerto Rican. How do we get people who are at risk of gentrification, how do we get them to realize that and then get involved in the fight before someone's knocking on their door saying they have to leave? So we kind of touched on how um, to get across differences, but how do we get to people um, who are living day to day, how do we get them involved in the fight? Because if they all just stand together, their asses in their own seats are their biggest asset. But how do we get them to realize that? Because I'm, I grew up middle class, I'm very lucky in that. So I can dedicate sometimes to this, how do you get people who are working two jobs to get involved? Thank you. <clears throat> to add another question. <laughs> Um, I, I, I was wondering how the hipsterdom fits into this. I think it's, uh, the what? It's, hipsterdom. It's, hipsterdom. it's always a punchline, a joke. People even laugh when you say it. But there's something, uh, it's not about tight jeans. There's something very sick about using education um, as uh, depoliticizing education, using it to build people's tastes as opposed to using it to learn about your position in the world and how you need to fight for the things that are important. So I'm wondering how that, and I see that as a, in Sarah's book, I kept thinking of that because it really fits into that kind of blending of culture and, and defanging of people. Hmm. Thanks, Brian. So we need to move a little quicker or everybody won't get to go, and I'd really like everyone to say what's on their mind, those who have their hands up. So, Hi, uh, Timothy. Excuse me. Timothy Pierce, Gargoyle Pearson from California Pacific School of Religion. And my question would be to tease out that question about the church. And I'm a church goer, so I would like to hear um, specifics with regard to the black church. Um, because um, in the, after the civil rights movement, a lot of our pastors that received those doctorates and those high profile pulpits are very conservative in their views. Nonetheless, they are in their 70s and 80s and still pastoring these churches and they are applauding gentrification. And here I am, a young man coming into ministry, having to change that mindset. Can you speak to that and how would we bring the church back into conversation as if it was a church of the 1960s and the 30s? Thank you. Okay. We definitely need an after party. Yes. Yes. Right, but let's, let's keep Ooh. going at a pretty good clip and we'll, then we'll find, we'll, we'll find out where the after party is. Hi, my name is Silver. Um, I'm very, and I have no MFA, by the way, I'm a novelist. And uh, 
I, I wanted to ask Sarah, I thought it was very interesting, your comment about how the dialogue, I believe that may not have been the exact word, on gentrification has been gentrified itself. I'd um, like to hear more about that, wondering if you were referring to the sort of, here we are, sort of white liberals, uh, not everybody's white clearly, but there's a sort of a certain artsy thing going on, and um, going to the word globalization, how that would fit in, in terms of, you know, who's really pulling the strings at the top of all of this is a global elite, and that does go across racial and ethnic lines. It's all over the world. So um, I was wondering if, if that has anything to do with what you're talking about in terms of can we expand the conversation to be about a much higher strata of power and how that controls. And Thank you. anyone else quickly, if wants to talk about the Barclays Center and why they think it didn't work, that we opposed it and it's still Great. there. I love to jump up, I'm a little incapacitated at the moment. Um, so many things on my mind, but the primary one is in our class we're discussing how cultural memory in urban space is often examined as contested space, especially in New York City. I'm wondering how the stage is becoming contested when plays like Rent are getting more exposure than Anna Devere Smith, Fires in the Mirror. Any more questions, folks? Uh, Throw out a word. Queer gentrification, if anyone could speak to that, particularly Sarah or anyone else. Queer gentrification, thank you. More questions, anybody? I know the panelists are writing down the ones they want to answer, so we'll get into a good ending remarks very soon. So is there any movement to get like bathhouses back in the city? A what? <laughs> bathhouses. What? Missed that. Say again? You know, bathhouses, like, where, bath yeah. Bath can we, houses, can we have them And back? also, like, do bathhouses ever exist for, like, women, <laughs> interested in women? That was a question that my research hasn't really produced an answer to yet. Like, were there public space, public sex spaces for women, interested in women? I don't, no, I okay. <laughs> okay. Wait, just one more. One more question. In terms of globalization, how it's affecting the uh, removal of people from, from land outside of the cities and how it's affecting uh, people in such a way that it forces them into the city. Okay. Thank you all. Closing remarks, we'll start with Sarah. Okay, I'm gonna just talk about AIDS. Um, AIDS is being gentrified. We're being told a false story about AIDS where the most privileged people are being held up as the universal experience. So there's a lot of rhetoric about we've survived a plague or AIDS is over. That's right. There's 1.2 million people with HIV in the United States. Only 30% of them are undetectable. That means only 30% are getting the standard of care that exists, the medications that exist. In New York City, 1,600 people died of AIDS last year. Half of them were diagnosed in the emergency room. So what that is telling you is that it's a crisis of access to health care, which means it's a class and race crisis, and any rhetoric about AIDS being over is, is false. Okay, that's all I have to say. Um, Take a breath. I, I, I might try to use the church question as um, a vehicle to talk about something broader than maybe essential here, which is the, the vital importance of independence and the black church, which again, I'm not an active churchgoer, but certainly as the, the first person mentioned, there has always been an opportunity, um, more or less realized, for the church to have to be a real independent voice because for the most part, it's supported by its own congregants. And therefore, in theory, it should be able to remain, certainly when they own their own space, and their own voice as an independent voice. Now, broadening that out, the importance of independence here, as Sarah certainly so wonderfully pointed out, that we are losing those unique independent voices as, as we are driven in a profit-maximizing, homogenizing, commercializing culture. So any space that we have, on the macro or the micro, to have that independent voice to facilitate those dialogues, we need to grab. And... I would say one other opportunity there is, of course, nonprofits that have been around for a long time. And I, when, when you mentioned Harlem, I actually thought about also the Bronx in terms of like the point. 
um, or in Williamsburg, El Puente, some organizations have been around for a long time that have been able to hold it, hold on, even though they're so dependent on, on funding, which of course is not you know, self-sustaining, um, but to, to also be a place for community voice and, and, and protecting that community space. But again, they're always in a precarious position. Um, the very last thing I guess I would say is, again, this balance of sort of the, seeing gentrification on the personal and social side, um, both the, the problems of those moving in. I'm less concerned about those who are moving in. and the sort of, I, I'm more concerned about all those who have to be pushed out, who are losing ground. The 53% decline in black wealth in five years from 2004 to 2009. That's, that's nationally, but of course how that plays out locally with, with 5,000 mortgage uh, foreclosures uh, last year in New York in the black, you know, in the black community alone, uh, or disproportionately in the black community. So all of this, how this is playing out in very real tangible ways in terms of the loss of ownership and wealth and therefore then the independent voice. I feel physically spent by this <laughs> entire event. Um, and I, I mean, really, and I, I literally feel like this might be the last panel I do on gentrification. <laughs> For real, because I actually think it's really crazy. We don't have the answers. Like, we are not four people with, with the answers, and there will be no four people with the answers. And the range of the questions that were just asked really reveals the spectrum of work that has to get done. And so the next conversation I have about gentrification is going to be in a circle, and we're going to be exchanging, and it's going to be for real, what are we going to do? Because, I mean, honestly, honestly, like, I, I don't even know, I literally don't know where to begin, and I know just as an individual human being, I sometimes hope that there's this institution or there's this expert or there's this person who is studying this, who's, in, you know, who's immersed in this and who has some secret insight that I don't have. And I think the reality is we are all going to have to wrestle with it together. Um, and that means that we can't just show up. We can't just show up to a panel, right? And I, I think I'll, I'll answer your question most directly around how are we getting all the various actors who are stakeholders in this conversation, which is everyone, right? How do we get all those actors to be having the conversation? I mean, we're, that's not gonna happen when we have it at the Brooklyn Museum. And I love the Brooklyn Museum, but that's not gonna happen here, right? So how do we actually force ourselves to, now that we have been in this room, say, I'm never going to have another conversation that's academic, that's theoretical, that's just, you know, let's compare ideas. Like, for real, if we're going to talk about it, let's talk about it. What are we going to do? That's it. Thank you, Risa, and thank you, everyone. Um, so, Todd, Todd, can we ask, does anyone, do we or anyone else know of groups that are really focusing particularly on this issue citywide? Should we, can we name them either arts groups or organizing groups or some combination of both? So we can at least put that out. Like I think of right to the city, I think of housing as a human um, right, but I don't think of many groups that citywide are, right. are really fostering that dialogue and action plan. Does anyone else? Know? But again, yeah, more in locally. Fury, Fifth Avenue Committee, Make the Road, and locally, but citywide... Right, A and H D. The What's up? Listen, I just have a few closing remarks, and then I think we don't get pushed out immediately. You can stick around and talk, which is good. I wanted to go, uh, just in closing, to go back to what Paula was saying. One of the things that has sparked off the Novo Luz uh, development plan that she mentioned was, uh, I think, the city's first interna international architecture competition. It was won mm -hmm. by Herzog de Muran, and uh, I think that that's something just to keep in mind, that, that big cities are looking to our big cities, New York, and when these sort of um, status symbols of international architectural competitions and things like that catch on, they, they do have an impact. I'll also give a statistic I recently heard that 30 of the 31 sub-mayors of Sao Paulo are former military. And um, <clears throat> you can imagine what that means when these occupations who don't consider themselves invaders, as they're called by the government, what it will look like when they're moved out of those buildings. It will certainly be a military operation. Um, 
Yes. No, I didn't. No. Yeah, well, true. Hmm. Right. She's left. She right, all right. But, um, I, I agree. <laughs> the person does have a choice. Um, an hour and a half is certainly not enough time to discuss this issue and all the issues that it tries to encapsulate. But I would like to thank the Brooklyn Museum for hosting us and letting us try to get it started. Thank you.